By the way, he's Hello. the third Brazilian here. We have a Brazilian, like, you know, wave cake. <laughs> Thank you so much. Joy. Cool. Let me just double check. So everything is on screen. ID is on screen. Web page is on the screen. Cool. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Elias. I'm a Brazilian guy, surprisingly, like he said. We have three Brazilian speakers here. It's insane, right? Because what is the chance to go to Bulgaria and have three Brazilian speakers? So, but yeah, anyway. Uh, but, but we are in, from different regions from Brazil because Brazil is extremely big. And wow, oh, it's me. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, if you guys want to just like see if I have some uh, useful content for you, and normally, but not normally, all the time, I talk about testing. So if you follow me on uh, at Elias Nogueira in everywhere, except OnlyFans, of course, uh, you'll find me. It's a bad joke, right? I, normally, I do a lot of bad jokes as well, so please help me to... <laughs> okay? What, are go what we, you will learn today? Five different tools to modernize your testing infrastructure or testing tools or testing anything in your project. I will mention other different ones you can use, but the main ones, AssertJ, which is an assertion library, super cool one. Rest Assured, that is the best uh, DSL API or library to create integration tests for APIs. Our utility that will solve the problems of asynchronous API calls for us. So it's a combination with Rest Assured, it's super good, or without Rest Assured anyway. Wire mock that creates a lot of mocks, but there's a slightly approach we can use that is called service virtualization. And we can use the power of wire mock to solve a lot of problems for our teams. And at the end, I will talk about PyTest to extend a little bit the coverage we are, uh, we are adding to our tests. Everything here, you have some slides. So you blah, 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 slides, blah, 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 slides. And after that, you jump into some code. And all the examples, all the code that I will show you, you have this in the end. That is my, uh, my uh, personal page. You can see it. You can have everything later, OK? If you guys want to ask questions during the talk, please do it. Because like, I will talk about search A, and you have some questions, raise your hand. You will have a question answered, thankfully, OK? Or hopefully. So Acer J, just to uh, give you an overview, it has 2.4K of stars on GitHub. Why I'm just uh, showing these metrics? Because sometimes it's good, because okay, there's a lot of people using it. And liking it, actually, right? If you give a star on GitHub, you really love it because no one does this, right? So what we can do with AssertJ? AssertJ is an assertion library. It will provide only functions to assert something. You have an actual result. You have an expected result. You need to see if the actual is equal or something like this to the expected result. And uh, AssertJ solve some problems for assertion libraries or for the assertion methods we have on testing or JUnit. Even JUnit 5 that has improved a lot in the assertion part, my perspective, AssertJ is even better. Even though you are using, for example, JUnit 5, I'm using AssertJ instead of searches from JUnit 5 because it's better, it's flexible, and adds more readability to your code. And uh, one thing good, not one thing, there is a lot of things good, you can, in a fluent way, do all the things that is written there, like test primitive types, of course, common types, like optional predicate, streams, like everything you have in Java, you can have uh, a way to test it, to compare it, like temporal types, atomic types, etc. I will show you cool features, because there's a lot of features for all these types. I will show you my two to three best features of this. So the first one is the recursive comparison Code is not that good in this slide, but I will demonstrate this. What is the problem, uh, what I'm trying to solve here? Normally, we have two different objects that are similar, right? For example, for microservices, you have your model object and you have a DTO. And they are exactly the same, but you need to somehow like, create an create a, a a additional class just to transfer the object. Sometimes we need to compare, OK, is this object equal to this one? And if you do a normal equals, what happens? I will show to you. So let's see one thing. Uh, Assert J example. Cool. So here, 
Is that okay? You guys can see it back there as well? Yeah? Cool. So I have two objects. They have exactly the same data. The only different one is called simulation and another simulation DTO. Cool? Uh, yeah, sir, that. Uh, everything with uh, assert J starts with assert that. That makes sense, like assert that thing is, or have a lot of different things, so assert that. Simulation one is equal to simulation two. What are gonna happen here? It seems equal, right? The data seems equal. But the equals to, what the equals does for Java class? It's the reference, it's not a data. And if I run this, even though I have exactly the data, I'm comparing the reference, and there are two different objects, because of course, it makes sense even by the name. Simulation, simulation, DTO. How I can solve this? I can break it down in a lot of steps for assertion. That is the most common thing. And it's time consuming, it's boring. If there's one extra field, I need to add one extra field. How I can solve this? Easily, there's a feature called use recursive, uh, using recursive comparison. And for this, I would tell is equal to simulations too. I will just run, and after that, I will explain this. What does this uh, uh, is doing behind the scenes? It runs without any issue. What this uh, recurs recursive comparison does? Uh, it sees, uh, it sees that, of course, there are different references, but I will go field by field in both and try to compare the field value, not the, refer not the reference of the class. And we'll do this magic, and it runs. Of course, I can ignore some fields, I can add extra fields, etc. but this is perfect. This will save you guys a lot of lines of code. And when we save a lot of lines of code, it's more readable, it's better to maintenance. Okay, and if I add some fields in both, I don't need to do anything in an assertion. It's done in the object itself. Cool. Second thing, uh, there's something called soft assertions. And what is soft assertions actually? Normally we know hard assertions. Hard assertions are tests like I have two assertions. If the first fails, the whole test fails, right? and it doesn't go to the next one or next and next and next. Soft assertions, I have a way to assert everything, like I have three. If one fails, I still continue the assertions until it ends, and after that, I show the issues. Why is it cool sometimes? Because if I have an object, I need to see some specific things for the object, more than one, but I, don't, I, I need to see if everything is okay or something is not okay, as soft assertions are the best ones. And doesn't consume, actually, it, the, the difference between hard assertions and soft assertions, during only the warm up time, only the library to do this is one second. And if you have thousands of tests, it's only one second for the first time, and after that, it's running everything. So, what I have here in the code, I have a soft assertion, so I assert softly. So, I use this reference to assert that get name is equal to John. Insurance is true, is greater than that. And if I have some issue on that, the test will run till the end. How does this look like? What I added it, integration. Ah, this is a view I need to do. I don't remember. No, it's not this one. Integration custom assert. It's not this one as well. So, do you guys need the live code for this one? Or it's straightforward? Straightforward? Okay, cool. You guys are in charge here. I'm just like trying to facilitate here. Uh, the second thing that is like, I love this feature because I do a lot of, in a lot of integration tests in the APIs. I need to assert a lot of different aspects of my object, a lot of fields. So, this is perfect. And what you can do that is a super, super, super cool feature, it's create your custom assertion. And for example, I have 
I'm trying to create a loan system. And for a loan system, I have a minimum installments that I can apply, and I have a minimum amount I can apply, right? And if I'm not like in this uh, rule, I can just throw exceptions and or say, OK, it's not allowed. But in my test, I need to do maybe some if else or create some small abstraction to tell, OK, this is valid, this is not valid. And with custom assertions, I can r create these custom assertions and try to prevent some code duplications and add more readability to it. So if we see in this slide, like I have my simulation assert, assert that the simulation has valid installments. But how I can do this trick? Uh, using assertJ specifically, uh, and uh, this da -da -da, da -da, custom assertion. Uh, let me remove. One thing about custom assertion, I have a specific class for that. And I'm extending this feature from uh, assertJ. I can do this. It's abstract assert. I'm telling, OK, my class is abstract assert. And the subject of uh, assertion is simulation. Uh, I'm just doing some things required, and I need a constructor. But what I have here, I have uh, one main thing. I must create this assert that to still have the same pattern of assert J, create assert that something. And it's a builder later, so I'm returning the, 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 the class. And I have here my validation. So I said, this, I said that, has valid installments. OK, if actual, which is my object, but subject of assertion, and uh, get installments, it's less than 2 or greater or equal to 48 installments. Installments are not like I can throw any fail message, OK? I'm doing the same here for the amount. And now I have as an assertion. And I can use this in all of kind of assertions that I have in my app. OK? Uh, again, just to show the code. I need to see more tips and tricks from IntelliJ because it needs to like, learn in all the, the, the keys to be faster on that. Uh, pa, 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 cost on assertions. Yeah. So, same thing. What do you have? What what do you happen here? Uh, I have like valid installments and valid amount. My installments are one, so it will fail, right? And remember the hard versus soft assertions. I will run this. It failed with the message I have there in the custom assertion. And by the way, I'm using the custom assertion first, the class. Simulation assert dot assert that. Cool? It stopped here because it's a hard assertion. But I can do the same as soft assertion for custom objects. But it requires me to create also uh, an abstraction. But I will just run this. You're going to see that both will fail because both are not like uh, attaining the requirements. And uh, at the top is better. The, the first is, was installments. Oops. The second one was the mount. It didn't stop, it didn't halt my test. So it's continued the execution. And this is the one of the most beautiful things you can do if you create custom assertions for you. How we can create custom assertions in this way is this, as the same thing as we, do, uh, as, as, we, uh, as we did with the soft assertions. And I will use the normal assertion that I created before, but I will extend the abstract soft assertions. I will use the same uh, subject of assertion, that is my simulation. I will do a proxy to that. And I need to implement the assert softly, which is the method name uh, from assertj to do it. And I just need to send it to the provider and AssertJ internally will do all the internals to throw the message, to show the line code, throw the, the stack trace and everything. So I have a few lines of code. I can have a custom soft assertion as well. And this will help you where? To help others to understand better your code. And of course, to speed up the task creation when you need to do kinds of assertion like this custom ones. Cool. Any question?
Nice. Oops, not this one. You have all the examples, everything explained here is later on in the slides, but rest assured. Who here used rest assured, actually? Few people. I love this library because you guys know Quarkus, right? Quarkus is quite famous right now. I know that maybe you guys are uh, Spring Boot developers or know a lot of, knows a lot of Spring Boot, but even my Spring Boot project, I use Brush Assured, and Quarkus use it by default because it's awesome too. Uh, Brush Assured is a DSL in Java. It's used the keywords given when then, but it's not BDD. It's just to express you that the given is a precondition, when is an action, and then is expected result. So when I have, like for this, this example, a path parameter uh, called uh, name, which is Elias, when I post something, I can check the stats code. But by the way, this is wrong because when I post something, it shouldn't be HTTP OK, it should be created, right? That's an issue here. But I know that most of you guys, and sometimes me, I'm, I'm doing this yeah, in the wrong way. Anyway, uh, when you create tasks with Rest Assured, you use all the time this syntax. So I'm just like, in a different, not a different way, I'm just creating an object to be able to create, like I'm creating a simulation with all the data inside. I'm sending it, and I'm trying to see if like, I can assert the, the, the result. And this is the normal way to use Rest Assured. And this is not a good way to use Brush Assured. At the beginning, it's good because you're learning, you're creating tests, but after a while, you have a lot of kind of duplications on this. And I will show to you how to solve this duplication in an awesome way. So, just to explain to you, the normal, the basic usage of Rest Assured, let me just put here because I will need this one. I have, for example, look at this. I have, given I have a param CPF with something, and I do a get for this endpoint, the set code is not found. And the other test, I have a different then expectation, but it's almost the same. The given, the when are the same. So it's a lot of code duplication. If I need to change this approach or change the endpoint, change something, it cost me some time to update it. So this is not that good. But this is the initial point when you're learning. Uh, the second point, what I can improve, with a specific feature from Rest Assured, that, that is the requested response specification. So what I can do for things that I can do as a precondition and things that I can expect, I can create these specifications for request or for response as a shared thing. I will have all the time this, this uh, precondition and this uh, uh, response. So what I have here, implementing specific features from Rest Assured for, for example, all the time I'm sending, I'm sending this parameter, so why not making one place changeable, right? So I can have less maintenance later. The same thing for the response. I know that all the time I have this HTTP OK with some message on that. This is scale. But you can see, I still have a little bit of duplications with this. What is the best way to solve this with Fresh Assured? What I have here, let's try to look at the test first. So this first one, I have this key. What I have here, uh, restrictions API service. Query, query CPF with restriction. So I can see in the test, OK, I'm expecting a restriction. It's returning an object, which is message version 1. And I'm asserting that the message contains this CPF. Look how different this is the test right now. There is no given when then there's no brush assured internals. The second test with no restrictions is almost the same. My service class will query a CPF. So probably successfully here, right? So I have the CPF, and assert that is restricted or has a restriction. It's false, because I'm expecting to have no restriction. And look how less code I have, and easier to understand. And this is still rest assured. But there's two approaches that I'm using here that is super cool. One is the service abstraction, and another one, it's 
I will auto-generate it, all the necessary code using OpenAPI. If you guys don't know OpenAPI tools, there's a library, you can generate the client code in a totally different perspective ways for Java, for some mobile clients, even for testing. And they have an internal library for rest assured. What I need to do for that? Oh, uh, what I'm doing first, I have the Wagon plugin here. And what I'm doing during the generated resource Maven lifecycle, I'm downloading the Open API spec from uh, this service. Okay? Can be internal, can be everywhere. And I'm sending this to an internal uh, 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 folder. And after that, I'm using the Open API Generator plugin. During the generated resource as well. And so, in that point, that will get my uh, Open API spec. And I will tell, OK, the invoker classes is there, the API package is there, the model package is there, I'm generating for Java. And the option, I'm, the library I will use is rest assured. So all the magic that, that has a, uh, uh, rest assured uh, does, and we can do programmatically, it's already there. If I try to look at generated code, I already have here. But, ah. So it generates all the code. And if you can see, I have for, like, for example, simulation API. It's, it, it's even using the request and response specifications here internally and doing a lot of different magic. I know this, but this is super boring, but one thing super cool. I will just scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Yeah. Can you see for deleting? Uh, normally, in Russian Shooter, I need to specify the path. But I'm generating the client. The OpenAPI spec has the path, has the objects, knows everything. It's generating everything for me. I don't even needs to play with the paths. If I change in the path, adding new parameters, etc., this code generation tool, the, the OpenAPI uh, uh, generator, you take care. And I have less maintenance, less codes, less things to do. Cool. How I can use it with an abstraction model? This is the second part. So uh, what I have here is the main is on the API client. First, I have a client where I need to build, for this example, like uh, restriction API. I'm building the object base on the auto-generated client. This is some, some kind of patterns all, all the time this way. And after I have the API itself, the client auto-generated, I have here the same thing but I'm returning a generic response. Because in this sense, I, I doesn't want to know what is the actual object. I just want this in the generic way. And what I'm doing, restriction APIs, this is the internal name that the client has, use, uh, one using get. I'm using a CPF path as a path parameter. It's here. I'm sending this function to be executed. Cool. I could use here, but what is the uh, beautiful thing? Remember in my testing code that we had one with restriction and one normal one? I could not do this with only this client, right? Because I need like two different methods to do two different tests. Or I can do more totally different tests. So what, what we need to do normally? Normal service abstraction. This service abstraction is super silly because it's only for one thing, but normally we create a service abstraction to encapsulate or to do a chain of actions for us, right? Like a payment. A payment is not just a payment. It calls a lot of different APIs, and after that, it's making a payment. So I could have only one method, make a payment, and calling a lot of different APIs, chaining the response, and using the hip response as a request to the other one, etc. But what I'm doing here, I'm using the client, and inside it, I can give whatever I want as method name. So I have one query CPF, and another query with restriction. I'm using the same API client, the same query, 
but what changes after my expected result will change. So I know that this query CPF, it's not found all the time, and it will just return false. But with restriction, I know that I have a model object, an object that is message version 1, and this will be returned. So what I'm doing here, I know that it will be OK, and I will extract the response message v1 class to this. I'm using uh, uh, registry uh, uses behind the scenes Jackson library, Jackson data binds to do this binding for us. So as soon as I telling the registry, use this class with uh, like do the binding for me, it will do the binding for you. So I can have like super easy tests in a super normal way without all, the, all that code, like given when, then, and all of duplications. Cool? Questions? No? OK. This was Rush Assured. This was my tips related to Rush Assured. You guys have all the examples. And our utility. This is awesome because you guys, when you test something to integration, Kafka, Redis, even search anything, it's asynchronous, right? But all the tests are synchronous. How we can solve this problem? Through the my Fox here will be integration test, of course. So we can solve with this library. And actually, the creator of Reshashred created this library as, well, library as well, because he had this problem at the beginning. So OK, instead of putting Reshashred, let's split in a different library just to make sure we can use it in a lot of different projects, not only with Reshashred. So our utility is a DSL that solves this problem with asynchronous systems. So everything, RabbitMQ, Kafka, etc. And we can create conditions for waiting, supporting a lot of different things, atomic structures, uh, conditions to wait, checking fields first, or checking a lot of fields. We can have integrations for tests with a search uh, We can have a lot of things, even ignoring exceptions to just make sure, OK, sometimes I know that it will throw exception, but if I try a little bit more and wait a little bit, it will return a success for me. I can do a lot of things. And this is really easy. Uh, I will jump on. I will jump these slides with the examples I will show through the code. So, what the problem I have here? So, is this class? Uh, I just need to change the branch. Yeah, it's the. I have a super silly thing because I'm super lazy. I don't. I don't like to. Okay, I've implement Kafka and do a super big system to just so show to you some like a, a, a synchronous one. I create a super silly thing. Every time that I do something in my API, I will record like some metadata. OK, I did that. It's super common, right, when we need to uh, audit some systems. And uh, I'm just adding some waiting time on that. So just for you to understand, I have this event service that every time that I call this add event, <laughs> I have a thread slip, a super silly one. Seven seconds later, I have this event in the database. OK? Just to illustrate how I can easily work with that, of course, you guys will use uh, like a system, a normal system for that, Kafka, Redis, etc. OK? So every time I do some operations in my API, I have this logged in this event database. Uh, and I will run this. And I will run this. Yeah. Credit application, da -da -da. it's a Spring Boot application anyway. Uh, it's not native, so it will take four seconds to start up. Yep. And uh, one thing, what I will do? Ah, wrong port. I'm using the Swagger one. Uh, for example, every time I will create a simulation, in this case, where you create a resource. I will log this in the database, but it will cost me seven seconds to have it there to simulate this asynchronous thing, OK? Just show to you that I will let me just reset what I had before. Cool. Uh, I will try out. I have a payload here. I will execute. And uh, yeah. And I will try to see. Ah, I need to log in. 
And I use H2, so guys, don't do this. It's just examples for you to illustrate how it works, okay? Yeah, you can use H2, yeah, but yeah. You have test containers for that. You can use my, any database. Opa, event store. So it's already here, so I will do once more. Oops, no, here. Uh, da -da, execute again, but let me just change. Da -da -da -da, uh -huh. Execute. I will try to see, and I don't have any new data, right? And uh, now I have a data. It's normal a synchronous system, but it's not a synchronous system, guys, please, okay? Just for illustration. I, I will keep saying this all the time because yeah, the example is super silly. If I try to test it, what do you have? Let's stop here. Stop. Yeah. Uh, event test. So, first, I have a super silly test that is the normal one. I will try to check for a restriction. It will add an event because I'm trying to check something. And I'm, OK, check if I have that event there in the event API or database, it, wherever. Of course, if I try to run this, it will take sev uh, seven seconds to have this event there. But my test is, doesn't know you need to wait, right? So just failed. So we try right away to check the event. How I can solve this? Uh, normally, you guys have access to the repository for it. So what I will do, there's a lot of different ways. This is the easiest way to use uh, uh, a utility. I will try to find a key in the event table. If it's present, I will return it. And I'm telling, I'm using this feature from a utility. Calable, it's Boolean, of course, because it's present, true or false, right? So until it's true, uh, when, it's, sorry, when it's true, it's OK. And what I need to do, to here in my second test, I'm saying I'm using this waiting time in my test because it needs to tell my test, OK, wait, please. And after you wait, you can uh, proceed. So wait at most 10 seconds until event is found. Cool. And when it's found, through my database, I'm checking the event through the API. It's a super silly example, but uh, it, it will illustrate you that now my test will wait for that. At least, at most, 10 seconds. So, running here. See, now, see how long it was waiting? Of course, seven seconds at least, right? Because we know that seven seconds, but we are waiting for 10 seconds. Super silly thing, but yeah, if I'm waiting for five seconds, it will fail. Because you, I have that delay of seven seconds. So just to illustrate to you, you wait five seconds. Five. And uh, failed. And the failure, if you guys will notice here, it's on the condition. That is awesome, but it's saying, OK, you have a condition to wait, and the waiting was the problem, not your request, subsequent request. Cool. Questions so far? No? No? OK, no, no questions. By the way, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. Is it brand new? So I don't know if like, I'm super fast or not. I'm trying to, to figure out it. Uh, examples you have, yeah, Wiremark. Wiremark super nice too. They are growing a lot right now. They have an awesome developer advocate. Uh, they have a lot of stars on GitHub. And what Wiremark does, for me, it's one of the most popular because yeah, I'm kind of using it a lot for quite a while. Open source tool for mocking uh, anything. And normally, how we use Wiremark. I believe how you guys use Wiremock and how I was using Wiremock. I have a stub, so when I get the URL that is a restriction, with a query parameter for that specific value, return that response error. That is a JSON with an error with a message. Cool. I'm creating a stub, 
just simulate, okay, I have an external restriction, an external API, sorry, that I don't control, so I will mock it. It's a normal thing for us, right? If I not control it, I mock it. Cool? But you guys will do this. You mock it. The other team that is using the same service, the same API that needs the same thing, they will mock it as well. The third team will mock. All the teams will mock the same thing. And when there's a breaking change in the API, everyone needs to update that. And in my case, currently I have 17 teams. So in my case, if I do something like in this way, 17 teams need to update the same thing. It doesn't scale, it's time consuming, it's not good, right? How we can solve this? There's some approach called service virtualization. That is more or less you create this kind of mocks, mock structure, in a server. You put it in a server and you make your different applications go to that server and check everything that is mocked. So instead of be self-contained in, uh, in your project and check only for you, you add that stub in another place and you do the request in another place. And we can do easily with Wiremock. So the approach here, of course, the server right now is basically a Docker container where you can deploy everywhere. And you can use whatever way you want, lo locally or in a Kubernetes cluster or any kind of cluster. And I will show this to you, how we can create this to, redu to reduce this uh, amount of time you might use in your teams to create the same thing. Okay? So first thing first, just to uh, illustrate to you, it's also super silly, guys. Uh, I have a different, like, it's the same application, but a different branch. Like, every time that I will, that I will create a new simulation, I'm checking for a restriction. Of course, because in this sense, like, I need to get a low one. Let's check if there's any restriction. If there's any restriction, I'm denied. If there's no restriction, you can get it. And this check restriction in this uh, example is an external API that I don't control. So I'm doing a super silly thing. It's super, it's super silly, but it's a REST template going through some properties to check this restriction with like the overlay port, etc., and it will check for me. And of course, on my unit test, this part will be mocked right in my test. I would mock it exactly like I, I was showing the, in the, the slides. And if I run this, I will just try to simulate this for you. If I run this in my app, and the port here will be different. It will be nine. Yep. If I try to create the simulation, but I try out so up there. Execute. <laughs> HTTP 500. I not even create a uh, <laughs> a good exception for that, but you can see 500 because I know that is I'm trying to hit an external service that is not available or there's some issue, right? How I can solve this? Uh, what I did, you can use two different approaches. I will show you the easiest one. You can use the second one that is also easy, but you require some code. Uh, wire mock, you can do everything through code, like the example I show in this slide. You can create in Java code, stubbing everything, or you can create JSON files. And we'll do the same magic. I'm showing to you JSON files. So, for example, every time that I sending a post request to this path with this CPF, with this exactly one, the response will be forbidden. And the JSON file that will return, it's another file that is this one that is just CPF has a restriction. But as I have this restriction API, I'm telling as well, when I have this restriction API, I know that is internal call to this uh, endpoint. And of course, I'm using the same value here. And respond at S at 200. And with that body, with is, has a restriction with a, just a little bit more message, OK? But what I'm doing here right now, what I will do, 
uh, I have a Docker file that will, I'm just creating on top of that the uh, uh, wire mock container. But right now, in three weeks, actually two to three weeks, they had, they published a uh, wire mock container on test containers, right? Three weeks, two weeks, yeah. They have an official image on test containers for that, so you can use test containers. I, I forgot to, uh, to, to update my example. So what I'm doing here, I have a Docker file downloading the standalone jar that will create the server. Cool. And the second thing in my Docker Compose, what I'm doing, mapping those files that I need to create this service virtualization and to reply to me. And actually, I'm using the port 8088 because it's the internal part I'm using that restriction part I will show to you. So what I do, what I will do, I will just run it. Cool, it's running, and I can see that it has started my wire mock container. Okay? It's not a container. Now I can use locally, deploy in a Kubernetes infrastructure, whatever. Remember that I just run uh, the check through the Open API, uh, a Swagger UI, and it was failing, right? It was given 500. Now that I have it, I need to just match. This is super important. Da -da -da. I need to match the same uh, CPF, the same key. And in my example again, I use the same key. I will run it. And it's replying to me, forbidden. That was exactly I have here. See, forbidden when I post in something for this endpoint with this value. It's magic. Now, if other teams need to use the same thing, I have a container for that. They just need to start up the container. I can even do better. I can just create a small cluster with all the mocks there. It will be available for everyone. I can remove all those. I can remove a lot of code, stub code, just creating this approach. And actually, we are doing this as well. We, right now, the, uh, uh, internally at the company, we have ephemeral environments. All the ephemeral environments for the service has mocks and shared mocks. So everyone can use that. And they are just sending the test for the same uh, uh, path that we have. And you can do this through code, of course, instead of JSON files, because normally, sometimes, uh, some people don't like to uh, play with JSON files. You can just write Java code and do the same thing. Cool? Questions? Yeah, please. Can I use uh, OpenAPI YAML to uh, simulate, to, to create a wire mock uh, endpoints, like uh, with the JSON? That is an excellent question. I don't know if OpenAPI generator has a library for wire mock. But this is an awesome thing for Oleg, your, your, for Oleg from yeah, wire mock. Yeah, would be great if it's Yeah, possible. good thing, I don't know. Thank you. But I will ask the guys from WireMock, because they are working, uh, try to work in a lot of different things. And I really don't know if like, OpenAPI Generator has a library created by WireMock or by OpenAPI tools to uh, create those clients. Good question. I don't, know, I don't know how to answer, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zo. Uh, the last two, PyTest. Who knows PyTest here? Few ones, yeah. Uh, it has like few stars, but it's awesome too. What PyTest does? Mutation testing. What is a mutation testing? It's, a, it's not from X-Men, uh, but it's a concept that we will try to, this tool will try to change your code for specific conditions to see if your code will survive for that change or not. And actually it should survive in order to be successful in. And we call this live mutations or kill it mutations. Live mutations indicate that you have something to work on, something wrong, and kill it, okay? They try to change your code, and your code survive it. You are expecting those changes. And uh, this is called mutators uh, for uh, uh, PyTest. And we have a lot of different things, mostly ba uh, based on corner case. And we have some. Uh, a lot of different mutators, like conditional boundary, and increments, uh, with mathematical operations and everything. And then showed you live how to do it with a super silly example. And actually, uh, we are implementing, uh, we already implemented 
PyTest to increase a little bit more the confidence for Jakarta E libraries and Jane SQL libraries. So before we uh, applied PyTest, the coverage was really good. We applied PyTest, we said, we need to <laughs> do a little bit more work just to make sure we are delivering like reliable uh, uh, APIs for the guys. What I will do here, PyTest, super, super silly example, we are going to create a test for that. Conditional, if A is less than B, A is less than B, otherwise B is greater than A. Cool? Classic thing, right? Like we are learning our first like programming language, we are doing things like this. It's, it happens. And I will create a test for that. Mutators test. Cool. I will just, ba -da -da. you guys will help me, okay? So, ba -da. add test. Naming correctly your test, but I will just like I, A, B. Uh, one thing I will do here, I need the mutators, right? Uh, private mutators. Uh, ah. Just because it's an excellent example as well. So what I will do, uh, a string, it will return a string. Actual is mutators. If I do my conditional one, and two, assert that, actual is equal to, is equal to, and I will just copy and paste this message, right? So, cool. And if I run this, it will run correctly. Nice. Uh, I will just do the same thing for B. B. So I will just flip, and it should be this, right? And I will go here, A to B. Ba -ba. Nice. I will run both tests. Both will run. If I use the feature from, test, uh, from uh, IntelliJ to run with coverage, 100% of coverage. Nice! My job is done, right? 100%, yay! But what I will do, just uh, to show you, we need to configure, uh, not configure, but uh, we need to uh, create a profile to run a uh, PyTest. There's a Maven plugin for that. And for that, there is a, on top of that, there's a JUnit plugin because it should be able to change based on JUnit rules. And I'm just saying PyTest, when I do test compile, apply all the mutation coverage that you have available. Cool. What I will do? Uh, terminal. View, uh, ba da Terminal, what is my terminal? Yeah. What I will do? Uh, MVN test compile. Let me just increase. Running the PyTest profile, okay? It will run super fast. Cool. It will generate some report here. Let me just reload. PyTest report, HTML report. And okay, it's 100% covered, but I have some problems. Can you see the mutation cover in test strength? It's red. And if I try to take a look on it, it, okay, conditional boundary, survive it. What is the fault here? I don't have any test for equal, as, exactly. So it's even a fault in my, my code, right? But I have 100% of coverage. Now you can understand how, uh, how uh, a PyTest can help you to write even better test and code. This is a super silly example, but there's a lot of different ones. And if you guys would like to see different examples, you guys can use the Jakarta project or GenoSQL project for that. Questions so far? Please. Ah, there is a, yeah. PyTest, 
Sorry for that. PyTest is an interesting tool, but as far as I'm concerned, it works not that swiftly. So it takes time to alter uh, all the yeah. statements in your code base, and if your project is yeah. really big, yeah. then, well, it means, uh, firstly, you have to run your tests twice, because the first run and run with mutations, and, yeah, yeah. and mutations it's itself mutations. takes a lot of time. So yeah. uh, my question is, have you ever used it in a real project, and how did you solve this problem? We do, uh, we do use that, and uh, for all the projects that I have the 17 teams, and uh, it takes time, it is times we are, uh, uh, like, say, it takes some time for us, like two, three minutes. It's a lot of time for, uh, during the build process. And we are like, spending this time because we know that it's important for us. If there's any mutation that is surviving, we are even stopping the whole building, okay? Let's see, and uh, the build, let's see, and let's figure out. But yeah, I, uh, uh, I know that like, for Jakarta, for example, in Jakarta data that is super small, it takes like one minute. One minute for a super small project, it's a lot of time. But it's the price you need to pay, you know, for the quality. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, just to, because I'm on time, so other modern test tools you can use as well, test containers, Oleg's here, I'm not talking about test containers because he will be talking about test containers tomorrow, right? Yeah, raise your hand, yeah. Awesome tool. Uh, Arc unit, because you can create unit tests for your architecture and patterns you have in your project. Data faker, that is a data generation that is, was based on Java faker. Take a look, it's awesome too. And there's one that's called right now Playwright. This is for front end testing. From Microsoft, it's becoming an awesome tool and probably will be better than Selenium. I doubt it a little bit, but yeah, it's a super nice tool to figure out as well. And you guys, if you point your cell phone and scan this QR code, you're going to win my slides. Yeah, no more of that. Uh, if you have any questions later, I will be here, of course. And if you guys have any feedback, I really, I really appreciate that. So you can give me feedback. It's, oh, you can improve this, this, and that, and not punch you in the face. I will love that, OK? Maybe we punch you in the face, but depending uh, uh, on the on the feedback, no I'm kidding. Thank you so much, guys, for being here, and have a nice event. <laughs>